Yes, 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 and yes, amen. The absolute truth. And I approve that message. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's good to see you this morning. Good to see me too. Amen. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Starting a new sermon series today entitled Sink. Uh, it's a word that's become very popular in the day and age that we're living in. Uh, everybody sinks their smartphones with their tablets and their PCs and all the other things that are out there. It's not really a new word. It's just become more popular in the electronic age. We've always talked about synchronizing, which the word comes from. And I think it's really a good uh, point to make. In fact, I was looking at uh, the first year, making sure that everything's on the same page, so if I synchronized, I have a couple of electronic devices in which have calendars and notes and pads on them, and also have another pad on my desk, and then you always have something in your pocket you're putting down on your phone, your smartphone, or something like that. So every day, at least sometime, I try to synchronize everything, make sure that I'm not going in 40 different directions, and I remember to do everything that I hoped I would remember to do. Sometimes it doesn't always happen, especially if I'm not in sync, so to use the phrase. So I talked in thinking about that and looking at that over the beginning of the year, especially, I thought, boy, you know, we need to get in sync to the Lord and get synchronized and getting with the Lord and in the Lord in our life and getting from Him what we need so that we can be in sync. My devices won't get in sync unless there's a particular software that syncs them all together, and it eventually and occasionally has to be upgraded. So I thought about in the context of a series of messages I wanted to preach about the new year and getting into the new year, that that would certainly serve as a great title for those messages of getting everything in sync, getting everything in order, getting our upgrades from the Lord the way that they need to be. In fact, in looking at this message, I, I thought about the first thing, you have to get the right connection, and that connection is with the Lord Jesus. I looked up this word sync in the dictionary, in fact, there were several definitions that came up in the, in the context of what it means to sync something, coming from the word synchronize. One was to cause to go on, to move, operate, work, etc., at the same rate and exactly together. Now, that's a pretty good definition of the way our spiritual life really ought to be, shouldn't it be? That we are moving on and that God is moving in us and that we're moving at the same pace, not ahead of Him, not behind Him, but walking with Him being at the same time, on the same page, at the same pace with the Lord, working exactly together. The Bible says that you and I are co-laborers with God. So if that's true, then our lives ought to have some kind of synchronization to them. Not at all like the lights behind me, which are completely out of sync this morning. Amen? But we'll get over it in a minute. It's a free light show today. We didn't know what you got. Get that when you came in. All that net money you paid, you get something extra this week. Amen? Another definition for sync was to cause sound and action to match precisely. You ever watch TV or seen a movie where it's just a little out of sync, just drives you crazy? You know, where finally the mouth catches up with the words, or the words catch up with the mouth, and just not matching correctly? Boy, you talk about saving us a lot of problems if we would do with this with our mouth in action <laughs> in regard to the Lord's word and His actions for our life, that we would be swift to hear and slow to speak. That would certainly put us in sync with the Lord. Another definition was, was to occur at the same time or coincide or agree in time. For us as believers, certainly, that ought to have some bearing and some weight that I'm not, I'm not ahead of the Lord and I'm not well behind the Lord. I'm walking with God and I'm on time with Him. I'm in His will. I'm doing what He wants me to do, saying what He wants me to say, being where He wants me to be, being in sync with the Lord's plan. Now, the last definition was a repetition of the other. But I took this from Romans chapter 6 is where I want to start today. One of my all time favorite books of the Bible is obviously Romans. And chapter 6 is certainly a profound passage of Scripture. Uh, I'd encourage you, if you want to memorize it, just looking for a good place to start in Scripture memory, start with Romans chapter 6. can't tell you how many people I've led into memorization of this whole chapter that it has transformed their lives completely. But down in the heart of Romans chapter 6, he starts talking about getting our lives in sync with the Lord and what it really means. So as I get into this, I'm going to read you about seven or eight verses here from this point of Romans chapter 6 to the end. This is in the King James format. We'll look in a little other translations in a moment as we go through this because it really tells us what it means to, to really get our hearts and minds in sync with the Lord God, realizing that He's the Lord over our lives and that we should be His servants, surrendering to His will, doing His will. Amen. Starts in Romans chapter 6, verses 15 and 16. We'll read through 23. What then shall we sin? Because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey his servants, you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked 
You were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin, you became the servants of God. You have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In preaching these messages on sync, we're going to be talking about a lot of different issues that relate very personal to our, to our lives. But to get your life in sync, first and foremost, you're going to have to come to a proper understanding of what it means to be saved, what it means to know Christ, what it means to be born again. We use lots of words, but it really gets down to the same thing. What does it really mean to know Christ? What does it really mean to know God? There's a lot of people in our culture, and prophecy indicates very clearly there would be even more so, who would say they have a relationship with God, but they really don't. And all through the scriptures and all through the New Testament, you see these warnings about people who have a form of godliness, but they would deny the power of it. Those who would reject God and read, read 2 Peter, read, read Jude, uh, the ch one chapter in Jude, they all, those passages deal with a group of people in the end times who would embrace religion and would be morally, it looks like, externally from the outside, you know, Christian, but inside their hearts would not be right with God. And inside they really, weren't be, they really wouldn't be believers. Inside they would really be living for themselves and not living for Christ. But it said they would hold fast to a form of godliness. A ritual. In fact, the Bible talks about how that there would be a great number of people like that. And, and one of the words it uses in the in New Testament to describe that, that kind of movement going on the last days within the church is, is apostasy. Apostate is someone who once said they believed the truth. They embraced the scriptures and the doctrines lightly, but they embraced it. But they denied Jesus' lordship over their life. They deny the, the authority of scriptures to tell them how to live their lives. And they, but on the outside, they would, they would look to be believers. Like Jesus used the illustration of the wheat and the tare, the, the weeds that were sown among the wheat by the enemy at night. Remember the, the parable? And it says that the, the, the two would grow up together because tear looks like wheat. It grows about the same rate as wheat, but it's not wheat. It's, it has no fruit. There's no grain on the top of the stalk once it sprouts. The other, when the wheat sprouts, it doesn't. There's no fruit. It's not the real deal. And in churches today, there's a great popularity. I mean, there's a big movement upon mega church kind of mentality in our culture where people go to a church or they get involved in a group where the word's not really being preached and the word's not really being embraced and the lordship of Jesus Christ is ignored, but yet we preach sermons that make people oh, feel positive and feel good about their life. And it's really just religious paganism. That's all they get down to. It's just religious paganism. We really don't preach the truth and we don't minister truth and people are coming and kind of feeling good about everything and they walk out having been assured after a 15-minute sermonette that they're going to be, everything's going to be all right. But boy, we've missed the truth of Scripture and so many people are wondering who perhaps call themselves believers are wondering why everything is out of sync, why they don't recognize God, why they don't seem to know God, they don't seem to hear God, they can't seem to, to find light and truth in their life, there's really no joy, there's, there's no peace, there's no power, you know, in their life. And, but yet, on the other hand, are you a believer? Oh, yeah, I'm a believer. I mean, you don't have to go far. I mean, just walk out on the street somewhere today or this week and ask somebody the simple question, are you a Christian? And most likely, many of them will come back, oh, yeah. Then ask the second question, how do you know? What makes you a Christian? <laughs> I'm a Catholic. You know, I'm, if you're a Catholic, you're a Christian. I mean, I was baptized as an infant into the church, and I'm a member of the church. That makes me a Christian. Well, that's not what the Bible says, is it? Well, well I'm a Baptist, Brother Joe, and, 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 and I go to Believer's Fellowship. So certainly, I, you know, and I sing the songs, and I even give some money, and I'm here occasionally, but I'm here, and... Uh, 
So therefore, I'm, I've been baptized. You baptized me. Folks, I, I, I may baptize you, but I can't save you. <laughs> Only Jesus can save you. And we have lots of people who come out, well, I'm a good person, I'm decent, I'm moral, I never killed anybody, and on and on and on it goes. Well, folks, how do you know that your life is in sync with God, that you really have life from God, that you've got the program down, and it's really not the program, it's the person, amen? Jesus Christ is in my life, I've been upgraded, I've been born again, I've been born, how can I really embrace that for sure? Well, instead of taking you to uh, the Baptist denominational literature, or the Catholic literature, or the Methodist literature, or anybody else's literature, let's go to the Bible. Am, am I in sync with God? Because if I don't get synced here, synchronized here, in pace, in step with Him, according to what He says, then I'm sunk, not synced. Amen? And I'd rather be synced than sunk. So if you want to know the difference, then how do you discover it? Well, I, well my, my priest, my pastor, right? no, 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 no. Let's, what does my Lord say? What does the Bible say? Because I'm not the final word. He's the final word, all right? You're not the final word. And if you're sitting there and say, well, you know, I just think, think about salvation. I, 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 I like to think so. You could be in trouble. And the greatest thing that anybody will ever do for you is to take the time to share with you what does the Bible say? And by the way, you may be sitting in this church 100 years and I'm just saved as saved can be. I would encourage you to do what the Bible says to make your calling and your election sure or to examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Amen? It's a good thing to do, to step back and say, well, when, have I ever really made this commitment to Christ? Is this, this decision, this, is the Lord alive in my life? Well, how, how can I know? Well, what does the Bible say? Well, Romans 6 gives us a, a real clear indication. These verses we read, seven or eight verses are a real clear indication of what it means to be saved. And according to these scriptural things and what it's saying, especially in verse 17 and 18, which said, but God be thanked you were the servants of sin, but you became the servants of righteousness. Right there, we have some very good indications of what it means to be a, a Christian. He says here, if you are Christian, then you're a person, according to what this would say, who has been changed. Remember what verse 17 says here? Verse 17, he makes it clear, you were something, and he describes what it is. And then in verse 18, he says, but you have become something. You were something, you've become something. So a Christian is somebody who has been changed. There's a great verse in Scripture, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that if any man is in Christ, he is a new. new. What kind? New creation. What's that saying? He's not what he used to be. That means he's changed. Are you a Christian? Oh, Brother Joe, I've been a Christian all my life. Well, I got some bad news. <laughs> bad news is you're not a Christian. You say, what's so bad about that? You're going to go to hell. You're going to bust it wide open. And eternity's a long time. Yeah. Amen. Now, I, I'm kind of saying that lightly, but I don't mean it lightly. It's a very, very serious issue. If you are someone who says that, well, I've been a Christian all my... I, I understand what you're saying. You, you, like me, I was brought up in church, amen? I mean, my mother had me in church. I, I know the doctors tell you new mamas, now you keep that baby out of the public for 16 years or something like that. 16 weeks, whatever it might be. Don't let him around anybody else. Listen, day after I'm born, my mama has me the next Sunday in church. Hey Amen. Go ahead and get all those sniffles and cruds over with and build up the immunities. It's good for them. I don't care what they say. Amen. You're here and your mama did it to you too, okay? You made it through. Praise the Lord. Uh, but, you know, we just, we, we, we live in that culture that's just, we, we'd rather do what the, what the doctor says. Well, it's good to get them in church. But I was put in church. And then I remember being in church about every Sunday, whether I wanted to go or not go. I, li I like what Pastor Ellis says. You know, he had a drug problem. His parents drug him to church. Amen. <laughs> I was drugged to church, and, and that's a good thing, but that didn't save me. I mean, I was in the nursery and in the primaries and the blueberries and whatever else was going on. I was a part of those things as well, but that is not what saves anybody. You don't get it by osmosis, amen? Because if that were true, we could all take our position in a fruit bowl today and call ourselves bananas, but it doesn't happen like that. You have to be in Christ. If any man's in Christ, he's changed, all right? You don't, you don't become a Christian by having Christian parents, by having a Christian uh, dad that was a deacon or an elder or a pat. You become a Christian because you've experienced this particular change that he's talking about in Scripture. Are you changed? Have you ever been changed? If you are what you've always been, you're not a Christian. Do I need to say it again? If you are what you've always been, then you're not a Christian. 
A Christian is someone who's experienced rebirth. A Christian is someone who's experienced a transformation. They are not what they used to be. I was something, and now I are something. I was something, but now I am something. What was it, and what am I? Well, let's, let's look at that, because I'm so glad you asked. Because this is the key to getting in sync with the Lord. This is the key to synchronizing your heart and synchronizing your life. Because in these verses that we've read from Romans 6, that 15 through the end of the chapter 23, there are areas that he talks about in here that talk about this one thing, what you were, what you became. What you used to be, what you are now. And what are those things? And if those changes aren't in my heart and life, then, the, then, then something's obviously missing from my life. Three things he mentions, and this is pretty much the sermon outline. First, there's a change of ownership. Second of all, there's a change of obedience. And third, there's a change of objectives in your life. And we'll look at these and lay these out. We'll start with the change of ownership, because in verses 16 and 17, he's talking about that, that we are servants of the Lord. But God be thank you were the servants of sin. You obeyed from the Lord. Now you're the servants of righteousness. The Greek word here is a word we've talked about in other messages. It's the word servant, and it's the word in the Greek language, and there's several words for servant, by the way, from the Greek language. But it's unique to see the word that the Holy Spirit inspires in this part of Scripture. He used the word doulos. You once were a doulos of sin, but now you're a doulos of righteousness. And the word doulos is that word we've talked about, which is somebody that is a bond slave. You own lock, stock, barrel for the rest of your life. There's no way out. You're locked in. You're a bond slave. All right? You're owned by somebody. You're not your own. But you know what the scripture tells Christians? It says, you know, you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit because they are God's. The Bible talks about presenting yourself as a living sacrifice upon the altar of God. Why? Because we are servants of God. Over and over throughout the New Testament, you see a very clear picture. If, the, if you're a Christian, you're someone that's a servant. Well, even if you're not a Christian, you're a servant. You just have a different master. And here he's talking about this change of ownership is that the master changes, all right? In fact, if we talked about the wheat and the tare a while ago, that the wheat and the tare, the difference was that when they're grown up, that the weed, the tear, the weed, it has no head, it has no fruit. It has no, basically, that's a good representation of authority over its life. In fact, Jude says there about those apostates like that, it says they despise dominion. They despise authority. They don't want anybody telling them what to do. They're their own person. I mean, nobody can tell them, not their parents, not the pastor, not the law, nobody. They just, I'm my own man, I do what I want. I remember as a teenager, about age, ripe old age of 18, when I, when I, when I, back when I knew everything, uh, I told the Lord back then, you know, I don't deny that you exist, I don't deny the reality of the cross or anything, but I just, I really, I, I don't need a God. I'll be my own God. I don't do my own thing. Now, the, the absolute arrogance of that is, is, it, is, un, is astounding, I know, to some of you. You would never say that, but yet your actions declare the same thing. Amen? And it's amazing to me that God didn't at that point in my life just kind of put his master thumb down, go, you know, and it'll all be over, all right? Uh, but he didn't. Praise God. His mercy was extended in his grace. He dealt with me in my ignorance and led me to the cross eventually where I found Christ and I, my life was changed. And I became no longer a servant of sin. Now, the ignorance of this is I thought I was a servant only to myself, but the Bible says there's only two heads, all right? There's the devil and there's God. You're going to submit to one or the other. You may say, well, I would never, I would never be a servant of the devil. The Bible says it's not a choice you're making here. You either servant of Christ or you're servant of the devil. You're a servant of sin or you're a servant of righteousness. It's a very clear picture. Now, you might say, well, Brother Joe, you know, I haven't had this change of owner, but I, I believe in Jesus. I believe. I be and that's, you know, the Bible just says believe. Whosoever may come and, and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that shall be saved. And that is such a flippant word that is tossed about that we sometimes lose the meaning of what this word means. In fact, the word for faith in Scripture, or the word for believe, is the word pestuo in the, in the Greek language. Pestuo is a word which means to believe. And it, it has to do with more than just being in, in your head thinking about something. You know, I believe the sun's shining. But it has to do with an action. And it's a, it's a word. In fact, the word when it talks about in this passage about believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a word which is, it, it is put together with not just pistuo, part of that belief, but it's pistuo and ice. Whoever believes on the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved, it says in Romans 10, right? And the word is pistuo and ice. And when you take that, that ice part and you put it with pistuo and make it one word, it has to do with motion towards an object, all right? 
I believe, so I move to Christ. I believe, so I follow Jesus. I be Real belief has activity with it. Real belief not only involves the intellect and the emotion, it involves your will. You're going to make a decision. So if I've been changed, and I truly believe, I have moved to the cross. I've moved towards Christ. I've thrown myself on his mercy. I've yielded my heart and my life to him. I believe. And there's, a, there's a great uh, illustration of this. In fact, the words Pishtu and I is a word which also was used to, to, uh, to, to name a particular law in the time of the Greeks and the Romans, in this Greco-Roman period. There was a lot of idolatry and a lot of temple worship to idols that went on. And if you were a bond slave, there was this law written in the land that said that if you, were, if you wanted to be freed from your slavery of that particular master... There was only one way to do it for you because you're a doulas. And that is that you had to come and present yourself to the temple priest. We're talking about the pagan, all right, the, the mythological gods and all the idolatries going on. You had to go present yourself to one of the priests there and bring everything you owned as well, what little it might be, everything that you were, and you would surrender it to the temple gods, to the temple priest, and then you would become a lifelong servant within the temple. It was called the rite of manumission. And the language is broke down from is pissed you in ice. I really believe, so I'm leaving this master and going to this master. That's what happens in salvation. You walk away from the authority of sin and Satan over your life, and you walk over to the authority of Jesus over your life. That's what, in reality, that's what happens. We don't always understand that. We don't see the clear picture of it, but that's exactly what's happening in the spiritual realm. Now, remember, salvation is not a work just by grace, praise God. And it's grace that when God, we move our hearts and affections towards God, and we humbly have this repentant heart towards God, that grace comes upon us. And man, the lift group study is starting, the, the new one on grace. You, ought to, you, you don't miss out on this new, we have Lift Connect Sunday today. Find a lift group, get involved in this study on grace, because it talks about how that this grace that God gives us is not just God kind of overlooking some fault in our life, but actually energizing, empowering our life to do what's right. So when I move into the grace of God, God moves in my heart. I am made a new person. I get a new master, and there's this new owner over my life that this grace flows towards and from. It's, it's, it's a relationship that happens. It's a miraculous relationship. It's called being born again. If any man's in Christ, that's that new creation that happens. And out of that spurs this heart. And this movement towards God where he's yielded to now in repentance and faith as my Lord and Savior. Well, Brother Joe, I just believe it's all right to believe. Well, if your belief is biblical belief, it will involve more than your emotions. I feel sorry for my sin. It'll involve more than your mind. I understand what Jesus did. It'll involve your will. And that comes from the grace of God meeting you and meeting your life and coming into your heart and your life as God moves on you. You're, you he breaks the bonds he breaks the chains of ownership of sin and slavery and Satan over your life and moves you into a new relationship, and you're still a doulos. But Jesus said, listen, you're my servant. That's what he said. You're my servant, but I call you friends. It's a different kind of relationship than what we had with the world and the flesh and the devil. Amen? It's a relationship. One man said it's a happy slavery. That's the kind of relationship he brings. First of all, the change of ownership. It brings about grace. Then there, that, if you get over the first hurdle, the second one's no problem, all right? If I believe I'm owned by him, then the obedience is another deal that's not so big a hurdle. It's a change of obedience. Verse 17. Here it is. But God be thanked that you, past tense, you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Catch those words again. You have obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Now that's the King James Version. I want to show it to you in a couple of other versions in just a moment. But the idea here is I get this first issue settled that I am owned by God. When I got saved, he became my owner. All right? Got that? Not yet. He became my Now, if, that, if I get that down, then I realize that, hey, if he's my owner, then obedience should follow here, and I can settle that. So obedience. But obedience to what? I've obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine, he says here. There's a truth. There's a message here which I have believed. And how, where's, the, where's the belief? Part? Obeying from the heart. Since I believed in my heart, the Lord Jesus Christ, out of that flows his commitment to him. And catch the way this renders in, the, in other translations. I think you get a little bit more the idea of what this obedience is that we are talking about. The New American Standard says, You have obeyed from the heart the form to which you were committed. To which you were committed. The, the Conabare translation says this, 
you were, you've obeyed from the heart the teaching whereby you were molded anew. Another translation, the Berkeley translation, says you have obeyed from the heart the standard of teaching to which you were introduced. Now, catch the whole idea here, is that you have this heart commitment you're making to the truth of God's Word, to Jesus first, and then since you have this new master, this new obedience comes, but it's, what are we obeying? We're obeying the form. We're obeying the truth. We're obeying the doctrine. We're obeying the teaching. The teaching, doctrine, truth of what? The Word of God. We have obeyed from the heart the Word of God. We've trusted God. We embrace the truth of God. We said, that's the Word of God. That's what I'm going to embrace. And sometimes we don't understand that, but the idea here is that, uh, well, it's, it's like a, a form of a building. When, when we put down this building, uh, we came in, and there, remember there was a form already down here. We, just, we added some square footage to the form and stuff, but what it was, there, somebody came in, cleared the land, and the form boards were placed down according to the master plan, the architectural design, all right? Plumbing's laid in, the steel's laid in, and then here comes the concrete. It's poured into the form, and the, it is shaped from that. In fact, the word form is the Greek word tupas. It's, it's, it's a, like a, it's a mold, a stamp, a shape. And we've taken the architectural design, and now we take the cement. The work crew begins to move the cement out to the edges of the form so it matches the form exactly. Those of you in construction, you understand the idea. It's shaped out to meet the form. What is the form? It's whatever the plan called for. Where's the plan? The Word of God. And what he's saying is, one way you know you're a child of God is, is that when the Word is presented, you're presented to the form. I come to the Word of God, and guess what? I'm being poured into the form. My heart goes into this. My life is poured into the book, and I allow what God says to shape my life. If you got that, say, uh-huh. I allow the Word of God to be that which I am conformed to, that which, that which I commit to. That's the standard, all right? And if we can get that down and realize that the word is the final word, it's, it's, it's the, the all-time end of everything, what God says, that settles it, and I, I submit to it. That's a Christian. That's what a Christian's called to, is to take the word, and as the teaching of the word of God comes, like the Bereans, search the word of God, and if it's truth, we're allowed to shape our life. We're allowed to transform our life. We're allowed to frame our, our heart, our philosophies, our mindset. We get down to the issue is, is what does the Bible say? When you're, when, you're, when you're facing questions about your life, your career, your job, your mate, whatever it might be, what does the Bible say? And what does the Bible say? Well, whatever it is, I allow my life to be shaped by the Word of God. He says, the form to which you were delivered in other words, you conformed to the shape. You have obeyed from the heart the form to which you were delivered. Now, the word obeyed is the word in the Greek from hupakao. It means to listen and to hearken, all right? What is God saying? That's what I'm doing. What does God want? That's what I mean. In fact, every time the Scripture, whether it's the Old Testament Hebrew language or the New Testament Greek language, Whenever it talks about listening, it is a, always a unique terminology which has to do with listening to hearken, all right? It's used of one, in this case, who on the, so, someone's knocking at the door, they go immediately to the door, all right? And, and they deal with it. And the idea for us is, what is God saying? That's what I'll do. I'm stand ready that if the voice of God or the word of God or the leadership of the Holy Spirit, I respond. I'm going to do what, he, what I hear. I'm going to, this is the life of Jesus in the book of Hebrews. It says, Lo, I come as it is written of me in the volume of the book. And it goes on and talks about how he came to do the Father's will. That's our lives as Christians. No longer listening, responding to the world, the flesh, the devil. No longer servant to sin. Oh, they still speak and they still allure. All right. We are still tempted. We're not perfect yet. But our heart now, it's I want to do what God wants to do. And if there's nothing in you that says, I really want to do what God wants to do, then I would question my salvation yes. deeply and seriously because there's something about the child of God that in them, you know, you just, you just want to do what God wants. Even, you know, yes, you'll time, there may be times of backsliding. You may mess up, but you know in your heart you're broken over that, you're repentant over that, you want to be what God wants you to be. Why? Because you're no longer a servant of sin. There's no peace there. You know, I, I've had a lot of times, as, you know, I've sat in my office and talked to a lot of different people who came in and 
talk to me about different things, and I hear what they're saying, and I think to myself, as a Christian, how could you even think that's right? As a Christian, what is so appealing about that? As a Christian, everything in you ought to say, no, I want to do what God wants. Yes, we're tempted. I'm not saying anybody here is going to be spotless and perfect the moment they're saved in the context of the present world we live in. We are made spotless in the presence of God. But there is something that God has moved into your heart with a new passion and a new desire. You ever just shake your head and say, oh, well, what are they thinking? I mean, they're supposed to be a child of God. Do they just think that's normal, right? It's not. But we're going to allow the Word of God to shape us. We're this new creation in Christ Jesus. There's this change of obedience which the Lord brings in our life. In fact, when he says we are, our, our hearts are delivered, delivered is that paradidime, and that word literally means from the Greek language to give into the hands of someone else. We have been delivered into the form of doctrine. We're giving ourselves over to the hands of God. We're going to let him be the one that shapes our life. I'm not giving myself over to the world or popularity or money or materialism or greed or this culture. I'm going to give myself over to Christ. Another definition for this word is to give over into one's power or use. It's the same word in Matthew when it's talking about John the Baptist. It says, and John was put into prison. It's the same word. John was paradidome. He was delivered over to the jailers. Now, what does it say about us as Christians? We've been delivered over to the form. We've been delivered over to the teaching. We've been delivered over to the word of God. And we're allowing those things to direct our lives. Just as John would be led about by a a prison guard, now we're led about by the Holy Spirit and we're led about by the truth of God's Word. So there's a change of ownership, which leads to a change of obedience. And leading to a change of obedience, and that also leads us to a change of objectives. We're not what we used to be. Guess what? We don't delight in the things we used to delight in. I used to brag on being the most drunk guy at the party. The guy higher than anybody else. The guy who did more wrong than anybody else. People flaunt their sin. The Bible talks about that in Romans chapter 1, how the end of the days, not only would people do what's wrong, they would rejoice. They, the Bible says they glory in their sin. But not anymore once you come to Christ. You're not proud of those things anymore. That's part of that change. Because those, that's not your goal anymore. It's, it's just not you. you. You're a different person in Jesus Christ. He says, in fact, he says, you are now ashamed of those things, is what he said in that verse. You're ashamed of those things that you used to do. You're ashamed of the places. You're ashamed of the language. You're ashamed of the actions. You're ashamed of those secret sins. You're ashamed because it's just not you anymore. You're a new person in Christ Jesus. I love what the Moffat translation says about this. He says in verse 21, what did you gain by it all? Nothing but what you're now ashamed of. What'd you gain? Sin never gives you anything. There might be some little peace or some little rejoicing or some little excitement for the season, as Scripture says, but a season is not a very long time. Whereas the rewards and the blessings and the, the grace of the Holy Spirit who works in our hearts and life as we obey Christ, the fruit of those things is righteousness and holiness, and life everlasting, the Scripture says. I mean, hold them up for comparison. Life with Christ, life without Christ. I think I'm going with Christ. Heaven or hell? Uh, I think I'm going to heaven. <laughs> but out of that also comes every other element of this, what God calls us to in our life. It's not like I can sit back and say, hey, you know, uh, I know what the Bible says about the church, the importance of the church. We just finished this whole nine-week series about the church and responsibility of the church, our commitment to the church, the bride of Christ, how Christ died for the church. But yet, we just kind of take the church to lightly. I'll do it when I feel good. If I don't feel good, damn, I'll go to church. I don't. Uh, got a little sniffle. You know, that's a sniffle. I bruised my thumb yesterday. <laughs> I stumped my toe. Kids got a sniffle. Well, if the kids got a sniffle, it's raining. It's raining. Lord, help us. It could be the end of the world today if it's raining. We certainly couldn't get wet for Jesus. Well, I know parts of the country and the world we go to and mission travels and stuff, you, you meet these people, they walk miles just to get to church. They walk my, in the rain if it's raining. With headaches and colds or anything else, they, they want to be in the house of God. Why, wow, their objectives are different. They just have a whole new objective. 
And if your objectives are out of line, then you need to get back to the teaching to which you were delivered to the form of God's Word and allow it to continue to shape you. It's like that with soul winning and witnessing. We say, well, that's just my personality. It hasn't got anything to do with your personality. It has to do with what God's called you to do, to be, to be a witness. It's kind of like the issue of holiness and living a righteous and a holy life. When you're so busy wanting to be like everybody else, why? Because your objectives are out of order. Your objective is popularity. It's not holiness. Your objective is happiness. I just need to be happy. <laughs> Boy, if I had a nickel for every time I've heard that, I'd be a very wealthy man. I'd pay the building off, I promise. So everybody that's told me that in this building, please give me your nickel for the service over. I just need to be happy. No, you don't. You need to be holy. Because if you'll be holy, then you can discover happy. But if you reject holy, you'll never be happy. Because happiness is not in this world. You're not going to find it. Now, you might drink something. You might smoke something, snort something, shoot something, whatever. Or get enough money to make you happy. But it's just for a moment. It's just not real. It's transient. It's not genuine. It's not the real thing. Because only holiness brings peace. Only holiness brings life. Only holiness brings happiness. I'm telling you the truth. I lie not. My conscience also bears witness. So let's quit chasing pipe dreams and get back to the truth of God's Word and say, Lord, forgive me for I thought something or someone or some situation was what I needed when you're what I need. Because I have gained nothing by running from you. I've gained nothing. And that's where I had to get to in my own life to even come to Christ. I looked honestly at myself and said, is this what you want? Is this what life's all about? Because if this is it, it's going to be pretty messy. But this ain't it. He is it. And he is everything. And he'll make the change. And he'll make the difference. But you have to surrender him as owner. And the obedience follows out of that. That submission to him as the Lord of your life then he'll transform you and he'll put this passion in your heart. He will put this objective in your mind. He will put this desire. Someone said, I told somebody, if I get saved, I just don't think I can do all those things. I, uh, what about all the things I want to do? And someone wisely told me at that point in my life, God will change your life and he'll change your want to's. He'll change your want to's. And he did. I got a whole new set of want to's. I want to love Jesus. I want to love people. I want to help folks get to Jesus. I want to serve God. I want to, be, I want to be in heaven. I really do. I'm looking forward to that. I'm not afraid of that. I, I want to be what God wants me to be. I really do. I, and I know my flesh fights another battle. The Bible says the flesh is always opposing the spirit. And whatever my spirit sets up, Satan is going to immediately oppose it. But hey, hey, it's one way I know I'm saved, that battle. That battle. But I also recognize the presence of God. Because if any man's in Christ, he is a new creation. And it, catch, catch the end of this here. This is the way it all wraps up. In Romans 6, 23, last verse of the chapter, for the wages of sin is death. 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 What's the wages of sin? What, what's the wages of sin? Death. It's death. But the gift of God. In other words, he gives you something. He doesn't give you what you deserve. You deserve death because you've sinned. But God's gift to you is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So as I said, I hold both up before you. What do you think is the reasonable, logical end here? The Bible says, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they should be white as snow. God says, hey, use your head. Come, let us reason together. Is this what you want? One end is sin to death. Which way are you going to go? That past sin, where's that go? Uh, that leads to fun. That leads to popularity. That leads to recognition. Hey, but where, where's, it, where's the... Where's the Where's it termin, terminal end at? Where, where's it going to end at? Sins and death. What about the other way? Well, it's obedience. Surrender to Christ. Surrender to his headship over my life. And that always brings life. Don't ever think that you can choose against the will of God and you're going to find life. It's never going to happen. I see people do it in relationships. I see people do it in business. I see people do it in the relationship to their parents, their spouse. There's sin. There's division. Sin always brings division and strife, heartache, pain. Jesus always brings life. There may be a struggle at times, but it always leads to life. What's it going to be? If you're here today and you really want to get in sync, you really want to sync your life up, then you're going to have to realize 
True life comes from the creator of life. And surrender your heart to God today. Don't sit on anything. Say, well, Brother Joe, I've always been a good man. I've always been a good woman. I've always been a good person. I've, I've always been in church. That's all just a bunch of religious gobbledygook. Religious junk. It's not going to save you. Religious works didn't die for your sins. Religious work won't wash of your sins. Religiosity won't make you a new creation in Christ Jesus. Only God has the power to do that. You must trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if you can't go back to a time in your life and say, you know, I nailed this down with Christ. I know that I'm a Christian because I've trusted Jesus. Then you're, just, you're not in sync. And nor will you be all through eternity. I want to encourage you today, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you do the logical thing and the right thing by coming back to the creator of life and say, I can't live this without you, and I can't go any longer this way. I ask you to forgive me. Thank you for dying for my sins. Come into my life. Make me a new person. I yield my heart to you. And I can't do what, you, what this word tells me to do, but you said you'd change me. And so are you going to give me what I need? But it starts right here. Delivering myself up to you and sub submitting myself to your headship. And here's the beautiful thing about that. When he becomes the head, he gives you the power that you need to be everything he's calling you to be. That's grace. Grace, grace. Give your heart to Christ. Now, you may be sitting there having doubts. Well, Brother Joe, you've certainly confused me this morning. Why? Where's the struggle? What's the problem? Is the problem that you can't come to the place and say, you know, I've never really <clears throat> come to that place in my life where Jesus was really in charge of anything. I didn't want to go to hell, so I prayed a prayer. And I got baptized or sprinkled or confirmed because I've always wanted to be a good person. The Bible doesn't talk about any of that stuff. It just says we're sinners separated from God by our sin and we need a Savior. And until we repent and come to Christ, there'll be no salvation. We, by faith, trust Him. We believe Him. We hold Him. And I commit my life to Him. And what's He do? It's not works, folks. It's repentance and faith. I just surrender to His Lordship over my life. And He gives me what I need so that I can work and honor Him with my life so that I can obey. So if there's a problem here, we're saying, well, I just don't know if I'm saved because I've never really submitted to His headship. And you need to do that today and give your life to Christ. Because if you're just going off doing your thing, they come back praying little prayers occasionally, and say, oh, I shouldn't have done that wrong. But you don't only recognize the lordship of Jesus or the, or the headship of God as God over your life, then you're in trouble. And the best thing anybody will ever do for you is be honest enough for you to tell you that. To say, listen, if you don't, make, if you don't get this right, you're going to die and go to hell. Because death is a certainty. You're not going to escape it. You're going to die, and you're going to go to hell, and that's forever. So make sure, as the Bible says, you're calling. You're like, How do you do that? You come back to the simplest. What does God say? I'm going to line up with what he says. That's all that's important. And if he said I need to repent and believe, I'm throwing everything to Jesus and giving him my heart, turning for myself, and allow him to save me. But if you're depending on some little religious thing you've done, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss it. True faith involves not only your emotions and your mind. It involves your heart and your choices. I will choose Jesus. Choose him today. As a Christian, perhaps this message has been a little hard because you have noticed that your objectives have been changing. You've started looking at the world. You've started thinking, maybe I could do this and get away with this. Or they're not seeming to ever suffer for that. And they seem to get away with that. And boy, I just don't feel like I'm happy. And all that stuff, you start believing in your head. The Bible talks about in First Peter, you know, that you need to be careful because it's possible that you can walk away from God, even though you're saved, and forget important things of your Christian life, like a blind man and a deaf man. And that's a hard road to walk as a Christian because chastening is just around the corner for you and it's hard and it's difficult. But God loves you enough to bring you a hard past and a difficult time so that you'll get your heart back in sync with your Heavenly Father. Give your heart and your life to Christ. And if you're a Christian and you found yourself drifting in your spiritual life, get right with God and say, God, today I'm trusting you, recommitting to you, surrendering my heart again to you. Forgive me for drifting. See what God does in your life at that point. One leads to life, one leads to death. Would you stand with your heads bowed? With every head bowed, as our musicians are coming forward.